Here we go. So we'll start with the little boy in Russia in the car. Those of you who didn't figure it out, uh, do you know the answer? And uh, number one, did you look it up? Or number two, did you figure it out yourself? So I think the answer is that it has to be the fifth president because if it wasn't the fifth president, was if the first, fifth president was not one of them, then he would have said three out of the first four. Yes. Uh, that, okay. That, and then funny story on that is I thought about that first. But then I doubt it myself because I was like, it's not 100% certain. Like, he Oh, no, it is, it, it is 100% certain because he could have also said, like, he had the first 10. It wouldn't have helped his case as much, but he could, he could, I don't know, I was thinking about that front. So I kept like going in circles, like, what could it be until eventually, like, like I just like realized that that's actually like what it was. And, and I've just been running in circles. Yeah, the, the fascinating part is I tried to tell it with the guy's excitement up front saying that it was so astonishing, so incredible. So, uh, and, and that was the part of the talk that should have been paid attention to, but I think everybody ignores it in the beginning, don't they? You ignore it and you don't realize that the solution is one of psychology and not of probability. Mm -hmm. And that it had to be the fifth president, which is Monroe, because the... If, if if it was if it was the if it was the fourth president, the guy would have said, "It's amazing. It's even more astonishing." Of the first four, uh, it, it would be Monroe. So that yeah, that's the answer to the question. I want I think it's one of these things where you kind of slap your head and you go, "Oh, that's so obvious," but you know, you didn't think about it when you were when you were talking. Was, What's that? It was, one of things that? it was so obvious that I was like, "But it can't be that." <laughs> Okay, so that that's another takeaway from here, Justin. You have to trust yourself, right? <laughs> trust that's your right. instincts. Trust your instincts. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's important. Um, so anyway, that's really good. Okay, uh, let's go to the uh, deal or no deal problem. Uh, who got a solution to that? Do you remember the deal or no deal? Okay, one, two. This was the three, four. Okay, uh, let let me let me choose one of you at random here. Let's see if I brought my new. Uh, I bought a new coin. It's a special silver dollar that has two heads on it. So no matter what you do, you flip and you get a heads, which is kind of cool. But unfortunately, I don't have it down here. I'll try to show it to you next time. It's really good for coin flipping. Everybody remember your number? Okay, we got uh, one zero. That's number two. Who's number two? I don't remember my number, so <laughs> maybe remember. it's me. <laughs> okay, guys, this is something I ask you to remember. Okay. If okay. everybody else remembers the, their numbers, maybe just number two. Is no, me. we don't want to do it by process of elimination. <laughs> okay. So let me reassign them. Glauco is zero, Theo is one, Matthew is two, Adam is three, and Justin is four. Okay, so we'll try it again. Let's see. Uh, really? Yeah, it's two again. Who had two? That's Matthew, right? So Matthew, what's what's the answer to the deal or no deal problem? Did you get it or not? Yeah, so my answer was um, the best way to do it is you flip the second card. If it's higher, take keep the second card. If it's lower than the first card, take the third card. That's exactly right. What's interesting is you can't really analyze this directly through probabilities, can you? You kind of have to use common sense. And once you use the common sense and you get the solution, you can find the probability of winning. What's the probability of winning? Did anybody compute that? 50, 50%. Is it 50%? Yeah. Okay. Which is, which is pretty good considering the fact that there's three cards. It's better than one out of three, isn't it? Which is what you would get if you just flipped the first card and said, I'm going to take it. It's, it's a deal. I'll take that money. Okay. So yeah, it, it, it's a simple problem, but the analysis is very different than from the, I, I think it's different than from the let's make a deal show. So with that, let me go ahead and, and, and share my screen. 
Well, first of all, let me put the uh, put what I want to talk about up. And now I will share my screen. And one of the things I have, I do have this writing pad. And I usually get it going before the lectures. I forgot to do so. But I have two screens. But my writing pad will not work while my, um, while my second screen is on. So I have to shut my second screen. And I don't know. I don't know how come. OK, so let me share my screen. And now I only have one screen to share. And we're going to continue with our, 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 our review of probability and random variables. And this, by the way, I think is, I'm going to go through it rapidly. If we hit a bump, let me know. But I think this is something which everybody is familiar with. Um, we're going to talk about the idea, first of all, of a random variable. While I'm talking, I'm going to get my, uh, my little pad hooked up here, which I should have done before the lecture, but I did not do it. And okay, I got I got a little noise, and now I need my magic pen. Magic pen, there it is. My little magic pen is hiding. So let's see if it works. No, it isn't working. So let let me do the Microsoft reboot, unplug it, and plug it in again, and see if it works now. No, it isn't working now again. Okay, so let me go to the source. I'm sorry, guys, I should have done this before the lecture, but I have so many meetings, and so many, so many excuses. Okay, there it works. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, so the idea of, of a random variable is simply taking the outcome of an event and assigning it a number. And uh, the, it doesn't matter what the number is. You can take, for example, flipping a coin, and if a heads occurs, well, a, a heads is not a number. You have to assign a number to it. So you can assign a 12 to it, for example, if it's heads. And if it's tails, you get you can assign it 47. It doesn't matter. Uh, many times, of course, the assignment of the random variable corresponds with the numerical outcome. I mean, if you roll a single die, it doesn't make any sense to assign an outcome of three pips. Uh, assign that the number 27. Rather, you should assign it the number three. So if the, if the outcome is numerical, it just makes sense to assign the same numerical outcome that you, know, that you would normally have. So each uh, random, now assigning random variables is kind of cool because each random variable now has a probability equal to the event to which it is assigned. And because there are numbers, we can talk about the ordering of the numbers. So a random variable is a number. And the way that we assign the random variable is something called the cumulative distribution function, CDF, which is defined as a probability. It's the probability that the x is less than or equal to x. By the way, this is kind of interesting historically. The Russians, for many years, defined the, defined the cumulative distribution function without the equality sign there. Isn't that interesting? And it did make it did make a difference, but I think that now universally the equality sign is there. It's x is less than or equal to x, and these are properties of the cumulative distribution function, which you probably know. It does turn out that um, that uh, since the cumulative distribution function is uh, a probability, and all probabilities have to lie between 0 and 1, that the cumulative distribution function itself must lie between 0 and 1. Uh, the second thing is that the cumulative distribution is monotonically increasing, um, which means it's non-decreasing. Those are equivalent terms. Now, monotonically, if you remember, allows it to get to a point and actually flatten out and stay there. That's still monotonically increasing, and it just keeps on going up. So this is an example of a, of a strictly increasing probability cumulative distribution function. And, um, and the distribution function always goes from 0 to 1, because what, it, what is this one down here? This is the probability that the random variable, and we'll always use capital letters to do random variables, the probability the random variable is less than or equal to minus infinity. 
oh, come on, that's always zero. It's never going to be less than or equal to minus infinity. And this, of course, is equal to the probability that the random variable is less than, less than or equal to infinity, which is always the case. So that's a certain outcome. So that probability is equal to one. So it's only, always uh, monotonically increasing between zero and one. Uh, the cumulative distribution is continuous from the right. Uh, this this uh, comes from the idea that we define the distribution function as the probability that x is less than or equal to x. So if you land on a specific value of x, you include that in the distribution function. So therefore, in your cumulative distribution function, as you're going from left to right here, as you're going from left to right, and you hit a bump, and you hit a discontinuity, you always ask yourself, where does that discontinuity belong? Well, the way that we've defined it, because it's less than or equal to, uh, we always put it at the top here. So it's continuous from the right, which means that if you come from the right, it's continuous all the way up to where you fall off the cliff. Now, if we didn't have that, if we did what the Russians did and had x is less than x, um, instead of less than or equal to x, we would have left continuous, wouldn't we? Right? But we have the less than or equal to, so that turns out to be right continuous. And the cool part, of course, is that the probability, the cool thing about the cumulative distribution function is you can find the probability that the random variable lies between a lower limit and an upper limit. So here we have a lower limit and an upper limit. And you can think of the probability that an event occurs, that the outcome occurs within this interval by bouncing these numbers off the cumulative distribution curve. You see, I'm bouncing them off the di cumulative distribution curve. And this distance that we get once we bounce them off the cumulative distribution curve is the probability. This is the probability that the random variable lies between A and B. So this is how we can take intervals and map them into probabilities. That's what the cumulative distribution function does. Okay, you interrupt me if I hit if I had a bump or something that isn't clear, or you would like more elaboration on. And of course, we have the probability density function, which is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. So this has some specific properties, but let's just spend a little bit talking about uh, density functions and the naming of this. This is aptly named. If you talk about a, we're electrical engineers, we've all encountered things such as charge distributions or charge densities, if you will, or mass densities. What, what's a density? A density is something that you integrate over and you get whatever the density is about. So if you have a charge density and you integrate over a charge density, you get the total charge, right? That's what a density is. And a probability density function is no different. It's a density function, except when you integrate over it, you don't get mass, you don't get charge, you get probability. So it's a probability density function. It's something that you integrate over and you get probability. So you can see it's aptly named. We've probably heard this so much that we don't, um, I don't know, they're, 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 we're kind of numbed by the meaning, but it is meaningful. It's a density function and it defines, it defines probability. And the cumulative distribution functions uh, give rise to probability density function criteria. Uh, first of all, if you have a cumulative distribution function, and we said that it was always strictly increasing, right? Or monotonically increasing, I'm sorry. Well, if it's monotonically increasing, that means its derivative at every point is positive. If it's monotonically increasing, its derivative at every point is gonna be positive. It's gonna have a positive slope. So that means the derivative itself must be uh, always greater than or equal to zero. Uh, the other thing is that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the density function is equal to one. 
And this follows from the, the idea that this is equal to, remember this is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. And we want to evaluate that between minus infinity and infinity, right? That's what we're doing. And what do we say F sub X of infinity was equal to? That was equal to one. What is F sub X at minus infinity equal to? That's equal to zero. So it's one minus zero or one. So the total area under the density function is one. And this makes sense too. We have probability density function. We can't extract a probability greater than one. And then, um, and then if we have a probability, uh, if we have a interval, say A, doesn't matter what, um, what interval it is, it, it can even be a disjoint integral. And we want to find the probability that the event lies somewhere on this interval. So we perform an experiment, we generate a random variable, and we ask what is the probability uh, that an event lies within this interval A. And by the idea of a, um, by the idea of a, um, whoops, by the idea of a density function, the probability that occurs on that interval is nothing more than the area under that interval. So this is, this should all again be review for you. One of the places where we empirically generate probability distribution functions if we don't know what it is and we have access to a lot of data is through a histogram. You're all familiar with histograms where you take the outcome, you divide, you divide your axis into little intervals here and you get an outcome and you decide whether that, uh, whether that event lies in a, in a bin or not in a bin. And each time that you have another event in a bin, you add one to it. So a histogram all has integers on the y-axis corresponding to the count of the realization of the random variable. And the interesting thing about the histogram is that it's an empirical estimation of a probability density function. We have here n is the number of data points, as you see. n is the number of data points. Delta is the interval of the bins. And the idea is if we squeeze the bins together so that they're infinitesimally close and we increase N enough so that all the bins are appropriately popularized, po popularized, not popularized, what's a one? Pop anyway, <laughs> what's that? Populated. Populated, thank you, thank you. Okay, I had a mental outage there. Yeah, that if they're all populated and uh, we let n go to infinity and this, so n goes to infinity, the number of samples goes to infinity and the, and the uh, increment, the bin duration goes to zero, we do indeed get the underlying probability distribution function from which this data was generated. So we can always take uh, histograms as empirical estimates of probability density functions. We have to divide by n here to make sure that the total area of the density function is equal to what? One, right? And so we divide these things by n. So if this was like, uh, if this was, well, I don't even know if I need to go through this, but if this was two, this was four, uh, four six, five, uh, three, boy, this isn't working out too well, two, uh, one, I don't know, say three. What we would have to do is if we add this as the histogram, in order to come up with an empirical probability density function, we would add these up. What do we get? 12, 17, 20, 25, 26. So we would, we would estimate the probabilities in this bin of two out of 26, four out of 26, right? Six out of 26, five out of 26, et cetera. So that would take the, the counting and make it so that the total, make it so that if we added up all of the total bins, they would add up to one, just like a probability density function adds up. So that is for a fixed delta. And if we tug delta is equal to zero, make n really big, we get an empirical probability density function, which is really, really nice. 
Uh, there's conditional uh, cumulative distribution functions, and uh, we are um, we will talk about that in a second. I like the conditional probability density functions first of all. Uh, the conditional probability density functions are such that we do the following. We have a probability we have a probability density function, an f sub x of x. Now, sometimes people get uptight about what these different values mean. Capital X is the random variable, and X is the number that we're comparing it to. So capital X is a random variable. Little x is the number that we are um, that we are comparing it to. So suppose that we have a value that occurs here on an interval of A. So all of a sudden, all, all, of the, all of the things outside of A are not possible. We're 100% sure that the random variable is in A. That's what means, that's what given A means. Now, it, we might expect then that the, that the, density function for f of x of x given a might look like something like this. In other words, just take this portion of the density function and just copy it, right? Because we know that it exists within this interval a. But you know, this doesn't happen because conditional, conditional density functions are themselves density functions. They have to obey all of the probability density functions. And if we just keep this part, we're going to have something which doesn't have an area of one anymore, correct? So what we need to do is we need to take this value at A and here it was before, we're going to keep exactly the same shape, except we're going to puff it up now. We're going to puff it up, and this is this is the actual density function for A. We have to puff it up so that it has a total area equal to one. And in order to do that, we find out that the f, uh, the conditional density f of x given A, is equal to uh, f of x. within the interval for x is an element of a, right? But we have to puff it up so that it has an area of one. We puff it up by doing, by dividing this by the integral over the density function, forgot my dx's here, over the density function. Let me change this, s of c dc. We need to puff it up by dividing by the original area. Notice if the, we do that, and and um, if we do that, if we puff it up by dividing by the total area by a constant, then the result has an area of one. Be why? Because if we integrate over both sides over the interval a, the bottom is just a constant, right? So that isn't affected by integrating over x. And the top becomes the same as the bottom if we integrate over it. So we get a total area of equal to one. So this is the, this is the definition of a conditional probability. Again, uh, to get the conditional probability, you need to take the original shape of the density function over the known interval. You need to amplify it by something. Uh, or uh, you need to amplify it by something so that it gives it a total area of one because again, a conditional density is a density function. It has to have an area of one. So this is the idea then of the conditional density function. We doing well, we doing well. Okay, we're gonna talk about uh, random variables which only have integer outputs. Um, this is somewhat limited, and I, I, I think a lot of engineers, well, they deal with integer outputs and, and discrete sort of probabilities when it's appropriate, but 
I think it's it's kind of binds our hands in a way. Um, here's what here's here's the way that here's the way that the uh, it's taught typically in the books. It's taught that we have. something like a P sub N of K, where this is K and K is equal to zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. These are referred to as probability masses and they have to be such that they add up to one. Well, let's see, so one, six, two, two. So say, say this is, um, yeah, let's say this is one third and this might be two thirds or no, one sixth, I think. So I think that adds up to one, is that correct? So this is the probability mass function. Now, I like to think of them better and we'll probably use this very consistently within the course of the continuous random variable. Now, this is a discrete random variable. How could we express that in terms of continuous random variables. Well, what we do is we give them Dirac delta weights, and you're all familiar with Dirac deltas, you're electrical engineers, right? And these are Dirac deltas, they are zero width, infinite height, and they have an area of one. So this one would have an, have an area of one sixth and one third. And the way we would express this is as follows we would express this value as one third times a Dirac delta of X minus two, where well, that's a Dirac delta. So with the probability mass of two, oh, this is no longer, this is no longer K, this is X. It's a continuous random variable. It isn't discrete anymore. So at the value of X is equal to two, uh, you get a you get a value of a third, I believe it is, right? A third. So you would write it this way. So we could write it in terms of the probability mass function up here. Or we can write it in continuous terms down here. This is a continuous random variable. This would literally be a probability density function an F sub X of X. That would literally be a probability density function. And the beautiful part about that is we only have to, uh, we only have to do probability density functions and don't have to worry about discrete, although we will go into discrete, but this is the general way of doing it. There's a couple of, of advantages of doing this. Number one is that sometimes your discrete events do not occur at integers. Say you had an outcome at uh, three halves. And maybe an outcome at pi, okay? See, the discrete random variable doesn't really allow you to, um, uh, to do things which are non-integers. And so we could have, for example, a delta function here and a delta function here, Dirac delta. And we could talk about this in terms of Dirac delta. So this would be, both of these would have values of one half, for example. So this would be one half of a Dirac delta located at three halves plus one half of a delta function located at pi. Okay. I screwed up. Let me see if I can correct it. I, that should be delta of x minus pi. So you can see we can place events at non-integer values, which is very difficult to do if you just talk about discrete math. The other prob problem, as we'll see, is there will be cases There will be cases where you have a continuous portion of a random variable, and then you have a discrete version of a random variable. We will end up with this lecture with, with an example 
where this is the case. This is kind of a hybrid random variable. And for a hybrid random variable, you cannot, um, you cannot restrict yourself to integers. You can have a continuous portion, you can have a discrete portion. The example which I'll show you later is the random variable of how long you stop at a stoplight. How long you stop at a stoplight could be zero, right? If you come up to a stoplight, they should call it a go light, but it's a stoplight. You come up to a stoplight and it's green and you just go right through, right? And that happens a lot. But if you don't come up and then the stoplight is red, then, well, how long do you wait? It depends on how long the stoplight has been red, which is itself a random variable. So I'll elaborate more on this at the end of this slide presentation, but there are cases such as that where you have both a discrete and a continuous uh, portion of your probability density function. And it, this is very nice because we can, uh, we, we can express it as a probability density function using Dirac deltas. One of the reasons that mathematicians don't like this notation is because they don't like Dirac delta functions. In fact, if you're a pure mathematician, you will not call this a function. <laughs> it's not a function. Something of zero width and infinite height is not a function. Uh, it, they call it a distribution. And so the, you have to jump through all sorts of hoops and, and they use other sort of uh, integration uh, techniques that, um, I don't know, they, they, they work, but this is this to me is much more transparent, is to keep on using the Dirac deltas instead of the discrete notation. Nevertheless, we will talk when it's convenient for us about the idea of discrete random variables. Uh, just remember that in the discrete random variables, we have these little dots here, which tell us probability masses and integer outcomes. And uh, for, the, for the continuous case, we use Dirac deltas. These, by the way, are called uh, Kronecker deltas. And a Kronecker delta Kronecker, by, by the way, was an interesting mathematician. He believed that uh, he, 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 took a, he took a side on the idea whether mathematics was created or discovered. You've ever heard that philosophical argument? He cited the idea that uh, mathematics was indeed invented. It was a process of creativity as opposed to a process of discovery. And he famously said that God made all of the integers and then man made all of the mathematics based on the integers. So all of math erupted according to Chronicle. Kronecker from this, but he has the Kronecker delta, which is which is denoted by a del of n, and this is equal to one when n is equal to zero. Where'd everything go? Okay, hope you got that. <laughs> I got this little button on my pen that I I don't know what it is. someday I'll have to learn it. Okay. Delta, uh-oh. Don't tell me it's coming back. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, guys. I don't know, these little pieces are coming up. So it's equal to one for n is equal to zero and it's equal to zero for n is not equal to zero. So if you had, what is this? Okay, I don't know what the, what the heck's going on. Uh, let, me, um, let me try something else. Oh, I guess I can go there and come back, but uh, Yeah, let me just let me do, let me just try to do that again. See what happens here. <clears throat> so I do have this. The the this this goes with what I previously was talking about. Now the impulse function. I don't know if you remember, but this is kind of the engineer's definition.
you have this little uh, thing here with the width of del and a height of one over del centered at the origin. And it's the limit of this as del goes to zero. That's kind of the engineer's definition of the Dirac delta. You notice no matter what delta is, it has an area of one, correct? And so if we squeeze it together and let it puff up to infinity, it still has an area of one. Uh, the Kronecker delta, this, this is what I call the Dirac delta, named for anybody who, know, who know, knows who Dirac is? Well, he won a Nobel Prize in physics for some of his great work in uh, mostly quantum mechanics and such. And then there's Kronecker. God created the integers and man created the rest of them, which is defined the way that I, I said. And I'll try to write it down here for one last time. Is that okay? So the Dirac delta is denoted by this. And the Kronecker delta is denoted by this. Where in both of these cases, these are zero. So the Dirac delta is in continuous time. The Kronecker delta exists in discrete time or discrete intervals, if you will. And uh, Dirac delta is an incredibly great way of, uh, of performing operations. And it's a good way to think about things. Okay, with this, let's look at some uh, commonly used random variables. This goes back to Jacob Bernoulli. Uh, P is a probability of success. And this is where you perform an experiment and you see, you see uh, whether you get a success or a failure. And the probability of success is uh, P and that is usually assigned a value of one. And the probability of failure is one minus P and that's usually assigned a value of zero. So that's how we get the uh, that's that's how we get those results. Okay. Now you notice that I have I have denoted this here by uh, Dirac deltas because they're pointy. And this is the simplest of all possible uh, possible scenarios, I think. This is Jacob Bernoulli. He was in Basel, Switzerland, and uh, Basel is a really important place. In fact. Euler became a very, uh, very famous for solving the Basel problem, which was a problem that came out of Switzerland. And I think that, I'm not sure, but it could have been that Euler uh, was at, at, in Basel, Switzerland about the same time that Bernoulli was. And has anybody heard of the, ba of the Basel problem? It was really foundational. It's a problem that was considered for a long, long time. And here I got myself down a rabbit trail because I'm not sure what the what the solution is. So let me uh, let me discard it. And uh, here's my Zoom meeting. But this was a problem that people had been looking at looking for for a long time for decades. And here, here's the series that he showed. That's just the Basel problem. So this was named after the place that J Jacob Bernoulli was. So it's the sum of the um, sum of the inverse of the squares of all the integers. And remarkably, Euler showed that this was, are you ready? Pi squared over six, which was an astonishing result because you look at this infinite series and you think, what the heck does this have to do with pi, right? There's no circles. We talked about this with Buffon's needle. Where's the uh, where's the circular stuff? But this was the Basel problem, and is one of the things that launched um, Euler into his fame. So apparently, uh, Jacob Bernoulli was from Basel, Switzerland, and he's like the box. You know, there's a bunch of Bernoullis. Anybody ever heard of what's a, there's Bernoulli's principle in? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. What, what is it in? Um, uh, it's fluids, I think. Fluids, yeah, that's right. That if you take a cylinder and you blow across the top, 
Try this with a straw sometimes. It's really interesting. You blow across the top, it decreases the pressure on the top. And what happens is if you have a straw and you blow across the top, the level of liquid in the straw will increase because you're decreasing the pressure as you blow across. That I believe is Bernoulli's principle. And they were, they were you, you know, box descendants were all a bunch of organists and musicians. And the Bernoullis were, I don't know, a family of nerds. They did, they did a lot of interesting stuff. So as you can see, that that's what that's what that is, and that's who Jacob Bernoulli is. And then uh, there is the famous example of uh, the binomial representation, which is n repeated Bernoulli trials. Hopefully, you have all seen this before. It's uh, the probability that you get k successes in n trials is equal to n choose k uh, p to the k one minus n to the k. You've all seen this, correct? Okay, that, that's that, that's good. The n choose k is uh, the binomial coefficient. N choose k is really kind of cool because the reason it's called n choose k is you can do things. You can look at things such as 52. That's a deck of 52 cards out of five. And that's going to be the number of poker hands because you deal out of a deck of 52, you deal five cards, right? And the number, uh, so this is equal to the number of uh, poker hands. And the number of bridge hands is what? 52 choose 13. Because you have four players, each one gets a fourth of the uh, fourth of the cards. Which one do you think is bigger? Are there more bridge hands or more poker hands? I think there's more poker hands. I wish I had a buzzer here. I'd buzz it, uh, Adam. No, it's uh, it's much more great. In fact, if you look at if you look at at choose notation, if you have n over n over two, this is usually the biggest. So when you're in the middle of the range, that turns out to be the biggest. And this is closer to the middle. And you'll find out that the that the answer is just incredibly much more large than it is with poker. One of the things that happened last year, which kind of astonished me, was that there was an artificial intelligence that uh, beat the, the world champions at Texas Hold'em. If you've ever watched Texas Hold'em in the poker matches, you see that the same people return to the World Series of poker, uh, poker championships. And I thought that was really interesting. I thought that the winning at poker had to do a lot with psychology of bluffing and things like that. But no, using reinforcement learning and uh, applied to something called the Nash equilibrium, which is a, a measure in game theory, uh, artificial intelligence is able to beat the best poker players at Texas Hold'em, which I don't know, surprised me. I don't know what you feel. But I thought I thought Texas Hold'em was a game of skill. And apparently, no, it's a, it's a, it's a game of uh, mathematics, apparently. So this is this is the Bernoulli thing. The other thing which is interesting about the uh, the other thing which is interesting about the uh, about this is that you've all heard of Pascal's triangle, right? This is one of the things this genius Pascal did. The guy that died when he was. Uh, You've all seen this, right? Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle, you know what it is? It is a lookup table for n choose k. This is really, really interesting. You go n down this way. N goes down this way, and this is like uh, n is equal to 2. I think this is n is equal to three, n is equal to four, n is equal to five. 
And this one is uh, K. I, yeah, this is K. So this is uh, th this line. This uh, corresponds to K is equal to one. This this line corresponds to K is equal to zero. This forty-five degree line. This one corresponds to K is equal to two. So let's choose a let's choose an example here. Let's choose four. Four is equal to N. Well, this one's really easy. This is in the n is equal to four. No, this is three, I'm sorry. This is in n is equal to f, uh, four and um, k is equal to three. And so it should be equal to four, right? And that's, that's what it is. And if you look here, for example, this is uh, n is equal to four, k is equal to two. And if you look at four, choose two, that turns out to be equal to six. So Pascal's triangle, interestingly, I think it's interesting. It's nothing more than a table lookup for the choose notation. So if you continue this far enough, if you went down to n is equal to 52, just by doing this by hand and adding and stuff, you could figure out the number of bridge hands. It would be in the k is equal to uh, 13 column and the number of uh, poker hands also. So this is our old friend Blaise Pascal. What a guy. Okay. Let's get back to the uh, to the lecture here. So this is uh, this is the definition of the so-called um, binomial random variable, and as you can see, these things down here are referred to the n choose k as binomial coefficients. Here's what the binomial random variable looks like. This is for P is equal to one. Notice all of these, all of these probability density functions have parameters. In this case, the parameter, the only parameter for the Bernoulli random variable is N. That's the number of trials. So that's the parameter. So we have a family of distributions which are uh, parameterized by N. And this is what it looks like for um, this is what it looks like for various values of n. You'll notice something down here, which is, I think, very interesting, is that this is like for n is equal to, it looks like 50, right, right here, that uh, this looks like what? It looks like a Gaussian, <laughs> believe it or not. And we're going to find out that our Gaussian is our friend. And if you do stuff to random variables the right way for long enough, you always get a Gaussian which is a very curious result. This is a binomial random variable for P. Oh, I'm sorry, we have two different parameters. We, we have the parameter N, but I forgot the other parameter, didn't I? The other parameter is P. So there's two parameters here. I misspoke. So we have the parameter uh, N here, and P is equal to 0 0.1, as it says in the top of the caption here. And here is P is equal to 0 0.2. You'll notice here as we get out to, I don't know, it looks like 20 or so, that it starts to look like a Gaussian again, or a bell-shaped sort of curve. And this is where for 0.5, and we really see the Gaussian starting to rear its head here as we get out to about 20 values of n. Uh, geometric random variable. This is something I, I've heard called the Russian roulette um, <laughs> random variable. If you have a, a gun and it has, I don't know, a, 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 the probability of you choosing a bullet at random in Russian roulette, you're all familiar with Russian roulette, right? The probability of you choosing a, 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 a bullet is equal to P. The question is, how many times do you have to spin the chamber before you shoot? So it's repeat of Bernoulli trials. You have a failure, a failure, a failure, success. Oh, you stop. So you keep on having trials until you have a, uh, a success. 
and that is equal to a, a geometric random variable. And the geometrical random variable here is shown as p times one minus p to the k. So this is the number, this is the random variable corresponding to the number of trials that you have to go through before you get a success. And we can, we, we, we can figure this out pretty easily. One of the things that we should have is all the sums of these probability masses should add up to what? That has to add up to what? I'm going to guess one. Yeah, one. Yeah. yeah, it has to add up to one, right? These are all the possible outcomes. You could have a success in your first trial, your second trial. You could have 49 failures and then a success in your 50th trial. But these should be equal to one. There are probably a few infinite series that you should have kind of memorized. One is the following, that the summation of uh, k is equal to zero to infinity of z to the k is equal to one over one minus z. You can see this is a geometric random variable. This is the summation of a so-called geometric uh, random variable. And um, the derivation of this is something which I remember actually having in, in high school. If you have the sum, which is the uh, summation, that's a terrible summation. Summation of k is equal to zero to say n minus one. That's equal to one plus z plus z squared plus z to the n minus one. And if you take z, uh, yeah, z times s sub n minus one, you get z plus z squared You get this result, correct? So we can subtract these two series and you notice how genius we were that the z's eat each other up and the z squared eat each other up. And we're left with uh, one minus z times s sub n minus one is equal to one minus z to the n. Or the sum of the first n minus one is equal to one minus z to the n over one minus z. Is that okay? That's always true. That's always true. It doesn't matter what z is. Z can be a billion and it works. But what we want to do is we want to look at s infinity. We want to look at this sum as, as n goes to infinity. In other words, we want to get the summation of k is equal to zero to infinity. In order to do that, we look at this sum and realize that if z is less than one, this z to the n goes to zero, right? If we have like one half to the n and we take n goes, goes to infinity, this turns out to be zero, correct? So in that case, if, if z is less than one, then this turns out to be one because this z to the n goes to zero over one minus z, which is the derivation of the geometric random variable. I point this out because we can, we can show that uh, using this geometric sum, that the sum of all of these probability masses goes indeed to one by applying the geometric series. Now, here is uh, the negative binomial Pascal. Uh, here's, this, this is a generalization of the binomial. The idea is that we want to repeat a Bernoulli trial until we get our successes. 
not just one success. The binomial is a special case of this for r is equal to one. So we want to get r successes. And this is Pascal's uh, solution to this. The probability that we use k trials and on the kth trial, we get the rth success. So say, for example, we want to roll dice until we get, say, r is equal to three successes. How, how many times, what is that random variable? How is that random variable described? And this is, uh, this is Pascal's negative binomial random variable. So it's a, yeah, it's an interesting random variable. And by the way, to get r successes, you at least have to have r trials, right? So the k here, as you can see, the K, as you can see, starts at R and then goes upwards because you at least have to have R outcomes in order to have um, R successes. So this is the guy that invented probability along with Fermat, at least the modern concept of probability, uh, that died when he was 39 and had all of these other great innovations. And this is, this is, like, this is where I put the history of Pascal before um, uh, that we talked about before when we talked about Pascal. So I won't, uh, I won't over, overdo it again, but this is a picture of his Pascaline. This was in 1642, he created uh, a machine that would be similar to an everyday calculate, calculator to help his father who apparently was in accounting. He finished it in 1645, let's see, he was, do I say when he was born? No, we don't say he was born. He presented it uh, one to the Queen Christiana of Sweden and he was allowed a monopoly over it by a royal decree. So that was his mechanical calculator. I bet you any one of you today could design a mechanical calculator, couldn't you? Maybe. Given enough time. Maybe? Give it enough time, <laughs> that's right. And the computer. No and a computer, yeah. right? What? Knowing it's possible gets you a lot of the way there. <laughs> it does. It does. You don't have to worry about it. And this, I mentioned also Pascal uh, published Penzace, which is which was his collection of apologetics and including things such as um, uh, Pascal's wager, which is still debated by theologians today. It's a very, very interesting proposition of why, according to Pascal, you should believe in God, even if you have doubts. I'll let you look at the slides and read this at your leisure. Here's the Poisson random variable. This is another random variable. It has one parameter and that parameter is lambda. We will find out that Poisson random variables are very, very important in places like queuing theory and uh, say photon counting. And we, we all know of cases where events occur like well, here, popcorn, okay? Popcorn goes pop, 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 pop. That turns out to be something we can model as a Poisson random variable. It isn't evident from looking at this, but once we get into stochastic processes that we will see this. Also, it can be used as, a, according to the Laplace de Mavre theorem, which we will also cover as an approximation of the binomial random variable when the parameters for the binomial become such that they're really, really rough to follow. And so there was, there's, there's a picture of Poisson. He's a 18th century guy, I guess 19th century guy really. And he was French. Uh, here's a continuous random variable. And we, we were talking about uh, discrete random variables. These are continuous random variables. Here, here's a uniform random variable, which is uh, used a lot. And so the idea is between a point A and B that your probability density function is uniform. And in order to give it a, in order to give it a area of one, this has to be one over B minus A out here. So this is the density function for that random variable. And we use this random variable all the time. For example, when we, when we spin a wheel of fortune, when we choose a random direction, usually we, uh, look at that outcome as uniform random variable between pi and pi, if we look at a random angle. So you can think of taking a, a wheel of fortune and, uh, and you spin this wheel of fortune and it's calibrated 
in some fashion. And what you want to do is you want to look at this angle, uh, how this angle occurs after a spin. Well, it'll be either here or here or here. And all of this can be modeled as a uniform random variable over the interval from minus pi to pi. In fact, in the dropping of Buffin's needle, you have to make some assumption of the angle of the needle, right? The angle of the needle in Buffin's experiment will be a uniform random variable from zero to not two pi, but just pi, because Buffin's needle, if it lands one way, it's the same if you reversed it 180 degrees, right? It's the same result. So you don't have to consider 360 degrees. You only have to consider 180 degrees. And uh, it works out pretty well. So this is the example of a uniform random variable used quite extensively. And here's our old buddy. We, we will find out that it turns out in mathematics, certain, certain animals are your friends, certain math are your, certain animals, certain math is your friend, certain math is your enemy. The Gaussian, once you over get, overcome the initial bumps of the Gaussian, you find out that the Gaussian is really your friend because it occurs all over the place. And this is the definition of the Gaussian random variable. And it is the classical bell-shaped probability density function. And it has two parameters. Boy, that's supposed to be symmetric, guys. It isn't. But the, the two parameters are the mean, and the other one is the standard deviation, which is sigma. So that's the way that the uh, random variable works. And uh, it's, again, the classic bell-shaped curve. You see it applied a lot in social sciences and statistical studies. And there's a reason for that. So again, two parameters for the bell-shaped curve, the Gaussian or normal random variable. It's also called the normal random variable. And the two parameters are m, where it's centered, and sigma, which is how far it's spread out. One of the problems with this is figuring out what the integral from, uh, say, minus infinity to x is. Like if, you, well, let me not, let me do this. Suppose that you have a Gaussian random variable, and you want to figure out the probability that something occurs between a and b. You want to figure out whether something occurs from A to B. You integrate, you integrate from A to B, and then you put this density function in there, right? You put in the F sub X of X. And you have to integrate that thing in order to come up with an answer. The problem is, is that this does not give a pretty integration. In fact, it's a it, well, originally, it could be considered a transcendental um, function that doesn't have a closed form solution. You can spend all day trying integration by parts or other things. You just can't get this in terms of exponentials and things of that sort. So what happens when you come up with something which is intractable to perform uh, in terms of integration? What you do is you define the function. And that's exactly what you want to do. Now, one of the things, one of the ways to do this is through, okay, first of all, here's a Gaussian. One of the things you want to do is this is like you would like to integrate, say, from minus infinity to x. By the way, the integral from a to b, get this right, the integral from a to b can be integrate the same as the integral from minus infinity to b minus the integral from minus infinity to a. Do you agree with that? If we have a function and we want to integrate from here to here, we can first of all integrate over this interval, the integral from minus infinity to b. And then we can integrate over this interval, the integral from minus infinity to a. And we can subtract the two and we get the integral from A to B. So the reason I like this is because that gets, gets rid of just the lower limit. We only have to consider the upper limit, which is X here. And so it's the uh, one over root two pi sigma. The, this is what we would have to integrate to get the probability. This is the probability that the random variable lies between minus infinity and x, 
That's, that's the expression we would have to integrate to get this. Unfortunately, this doesn't have to, this doesn't generate a nice closed form solution. In order to get this into a more standard form, we apply this variable substitution. You've all done variable substitution and in integral calculus. And by doing this, you get this integral becomes this integral where you integrate from minus infinity to sigma x plus m, where sigma, if you remember, is one of the parameters of the Gaussian and m is the other parameter. And the, um, the integrand becomes this. And the reason that integrand is so beautiful, it no longer contains a sigma or an m. It's totally generic. So what we can do is we can, we can call this something else. We can say the integral from zero to x of, or let's say, I don't know, it could be anything. Let's do a smiley face. The integral from e to smiley face of e to the z squared over two dz is referred to as an error function. And earth stands for error function. And it would be the error function of smiley face, whatever that upper integration limit was. We could use any variable that we would like. So here's what happens is the error function is defined as this integral. We can't evaluate that integral, so we're going to call it something else. That's the, that's the weird news. The good news is no matter what software you use, there is a command for the error function. If you use an Excel spreadsheet, there's an error function that you can apply to. If you use a, a MATLAB or Python or something else. You can always talk about an error function and it will give you the answer much like it gives you the answer of the sine of 33 degrees. You don't know how to calculate the sine of 33 degrees. If I gave you a sheet of paper in two hours, you probably couldn't get it to six significant figures, could you? I don't think so. You have to have a computer to help you out. So unfortunately, these ERFs are very well defined. So therefore, you can always take this integral and you can manipulate it into another integral. And the total integration has nothing to do with sigma and m. The only place that sigma and m occur is in this upper limit. And this turns out to be one half plus the erf. Now, so the erf of sigma x plus m. So that's how you evaluate problems of this sort. Is that okay? And hopefully you've seen this before, but there is a problem. And the problem is, is when you go to different platforms, you have a different definition of Earth. This is, by the way, the definition of the Earth as I have defined it. Okay? And it's a, uh, as you might expect, it's a cumulative distribution function. And uh, therefore, it's strictly increasing. But it turns out that the error function uh, for each element of X, uh, it's... Um, it's different. For example, this is the way that I defined it here. If you go to MATLAB, it's defined like this. Compare those two integrations. They're different, aren't they? But the question is, is given one earth, can you transform to an other earth? I'm gonna give you that as a, a homework assignment. And yeah, indeed you can. And so in dealing with the earths, <laughs> the earths, that's a fun word to say. Sound like a dog, earth, earth. Uh, in dealing with the earths, you can transform one earth into another earth. And so just be aware that in these different platforms, they define earth differently. Okay, uh, now we have the exponential random variable. Let me check my time here, because I think maybe we're running out of time. Yeah, we are. Okay, so we'll change. We'll, we'll, we'll save the exponential random variable for later. Uh, exponential random variable is really valuable in the area of reliability. Uh, this is astonishing, and we'll talk about it next time, that if your reliability is modeled as an exponential in reliability theory, then your light bulb, if it's lasted for six years, and it's still working, it's as good as new. It's really an astonishing random variable. Uh, right now, my reliability is pretty close to yours. I'm a lot older than most of you, and I'm a lot older than all of you. And um, 
the thing is, the probability that I live for one more day is about the same as the probability you live for one more day, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it turns out that if, if the exponential random variable applies, that if you age, you're as good as new. Of course, the exponential random variable always doesn't apply because we get we get into other problems. So all of these random variables have just fascinating, uh, fascinating sort of applications. So with that, um, I have started to assign you some homework out of the Garcia book. And um, so that will be available on the spreadsheet. And we'll have that probably due a week from now. What I like to do is assign homeworks. And then if you have questions, it's your responsibility to ask me those questions the next time we meet before you're responsible for, for the things. Uh, as far as office hours, by the way, we're going to have office hours right after the lecture. So if you want to stay on and you have, you have some questions about elaboration or something like that, we can do that immediately following the lecture. Unless some days I might be called <laughs> out of town or to another meeting, but uh, that, that'll be the typical things. Okay, any questions? Okay, are we going at, a, are, are we going at, an, okay for, at an okay pace for review? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, okay. Hopefully, hopefully all of these things will be refreshed and it's probably been, I don't know, a couple of years, maybe since you've had anything to do with the probability so that we'll have an idea. Uh, so with that, is there any other questions? Yeah. Theo. Uh, I have a question about the homework we did for today, but I didn't ask you that in office hours if you want. No, no, no. Uh, one of the things I'd like you to do is I've created a box account, which all of you have access to. I'd like mm -hmm. you to take the homework. Now, I'm not interested in the Russian, the Russian uh, problem. Right. But in the uh, deal, no deal, and before that, the let, let's make a deal uh, things. Yeah, please put them in there. And please put the homework number. I'm going to try mm -hmm. to keep the homework numbers and then put the number and then your last name. That lets me sort them easily. Okay. okay. If you just put them in there with ad hoc names, I have a hard time sorting through the homework. Any other questions at all? Okay. So we'll stop recording. If you want to stay for office hours, I'll be here. If you want to go, you can do that too.